All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Today we have Ford Credit Union and um, Sarah Buck, who's going to um, give us knowledge on how to open a bank account, what is a debit card, what is a credit card. And um, But before that, let's do your um, check-in. As you know, you need to check in so that your teacher knows that you're here attending this event. And if you have um, questions, this is a great questions document that you can reference to. And the most important part is the evaluation form. This is how we give you credit and um, attendance, by your attendance. And be fully present, pay attention, ask questions in the chat. And um, yeah, so I, and again, the submit your evaluation form. If the QR code doesn't work, we have the bit.ly link in the chat and also the actual link, I think in the chat will be posted in the chat. And that is it. Let's have Sarah Bach um, do her presentation. Hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you for joining. I can't wait to talk to all of you about banking basics. So I'm going to share. I have a uh, slideshow for you today. So let me share my screen. This is always the tricky part, right? Like this one. Okay, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Yay, all right. So yeah, I'm here to talk to you about um, Banking 101. And so uh, my name is Sarah Buck. I'm with Aura Credit Union. We're located in Portland, Oregon. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna kind of go over some really um, fun banking information with you today. So uh, here's just a quick rundown of everything we're gonna kind of touch on today. So I'll, um, I'll just share a little bit of more, about, more about me and who Fort for Credit Union is. Um, and then we'll dive into a little overview of you know, the credit union difference. What is a credit union? How are we different from banks? You may have heard that term before. Um, and then some banking basics. What's a checking account? How do cash apps work with your checking? What's direct deposit, debit cards? And then ultimately how to open a checking account. Um, and then we'll dive right into budgeting um, and then go over a little bit like what credit is. And then we'll have a Q&A um, at the end for any questions that you may have that I didn't cover or um, <clears throat> want to clarify something. So please feel free. So we'll just dive right in. So uh, my name is Sarah Buck. I'm the Director of, Ex Director of Experiences here at Fora Credit Union. Um, I've been in Credit Union since 2008. I started as a teller um, and it was... Not something I thought I'd do forever, but here I, here, here I am and I absolutely love it. Um, and in my role, I oversee learning and development. So that includes training all of our new staff, um, policies and procedures, making sure that everybody has the tools that they need to be successful. Um, I oversee our culture and our community engagement. And so I get to do really, really fun things like this with all of you. It's probably my favorite um, part of my job. So thank you for having me. And then a little bit about Fort Credit Union. We are a community credit union um, based out of Portland currently for Washington, Multnomah, Clackamas, and Marion County um, citizens. And uh, right now we're just, we just have a branch in downtown Portland, but we're coming to Hillsboro um, in mid-May. And so keep an eye out for that because we would love to have you um, join us in our new branch when we're out in your area. So let's um, just dive right in. So the first thing that I wanted to just touch on is credit unions versus banks. What's the difference? Um, it can be confusing up for a little bit of people because we do offer all of the same things, but there are some fundamental differences. So I just kind of wanted to start there. Um, credit unions, we've been around since the early 1900s in the United States, which is a really long time. But sometimes it can still be a little confusing on what differentiates us between banks. Um, so yes, like I said, we all offer the same products and services. So checking accounts, savings accounts, credit cards. We also have online banking and mobile apps. But there are, again, those key fundamental differences that separated us out. So I just wanted to touch on those really quick so you can understand what we do every day here as a credit union, why we do it. So the biggest difference is that credit unions are not for profit, which means we exist to provide financial well-being for everybody. 
It means our main priority isn't to make money. Um, yes, we have to make money, of course, to pay our staff and have branches to be able to provide the service for our members, but our main focus is to ensure that all of you are really taken care of first before we pay ourselves. Um, banks, they often will pay themselves first or their stockholders specifically, so that um, that's a little bit of a difference, but we love being not-for-profit because it really allows us to put our members first. Um, which brings me to the next key difference is credit unions are owned by our members, so we don't have customers. Um, every single person who has an account with us is referred to as a member because each individual person owns an equal part of the credit union. So this is done by when you open an account with us and you make your first deposit, it's just $5 for every single person. And that money, it stays in your account and it's in your equal share of the credit union. No more, no less. Everybody is equal here. Um, with banks, stockholders can purchase different amounts of the credit union, so that can give a select few people control and more stronger voices in the banks, which ultimately makes the decisions not member focused, and so it may only benefit um, a very specific group of people. And then the term member can still confuse folks today about how to join a credit union. So credit unions generally do start with a very specific group of people, often people who work together, who have come together to um, provide financial services to their uh, to that select group of people, which does create having to qualify to open an account. So you either usually used to have to work somewhere to join or live somewhere. But today there's so many community credit unions that are just like for it where it's just based off of where you live, what area you work in, where you go to school, where you go to church. So there is a credit union out there for everyone. Um, and so we're always trying to explain that and educate people that you don't have to belong to a certain specific group. There's credit unions out there for everybody and we want everybody to join. And then um, we always try to give back to our members. So if we have a, an additional influx of money that we've made, um, we often put that back into the membership so that we can give you better savings rates or lower light rates on loans to help you save money, better mobile apps to help you access your money easier. So we're always reinvesting back in our communities as well to make sure that we're always providing the best service and experience that we possibly can. And then just like banks and lots of businesses, we do have a board of directors who oversee the day-to-day -day activities of the credit union, and it's who our CEO answers to. Um, but they're all members and they're not paid. They're volunteering their time because they're invested and engaged and they're taking that special time out of their lives to make sure that the credit union is making sound financial decisions and going in a positive direction. At banks, they're mostly paid. Um, and so their vested interest is just normally a little bit different. Um, and lastly, something that I wanted to cover is that we have a community interest. So credit unions really got their jumpstart in the United States at the height of the Great Depression back in, back in the day uh, when banks were turning people away. So folks during this time um, really saw the desperate need for a trusted financial partner. Um, and hundreds of if not thousands of credit unions were actually born during this time and that are still around today. Like for it, we were um, started in 1936 and we're still here today serving our members. Um, credit unions have a motto, it's people helping people. And this was really derived during this time. Um, our members and our communities are our focus and we're always constantly finding ways to give back either with our time, or volunteering, like what I'm doing today, I'm providing financial education because it's so, so important. Um, and so we're always actively engaged in the communities that we serve so that we can stay connected to our members. So that was just a really quick overview of what credit unions are. Does anybody have a question or um, I need some clarification on anything? You can come off mute or type it in the chat. doesn't look like it, so. Okay, well, we'll jump right in. So um, let's get into the banking basics. So now that I've explained a little bit about what credit unions are, let's talk about a little bit about what we do. So does anybody here already have an account at either a credit union or a bank? 
I guess you can put it in the chat or come off mute if anybody wants to share. I can't really see the chat. Okay. Yes, we got some people. Great. Um, and do you have a savings account or a checking account? Do you know? Yes, lots of yeses. Yay. That's great. Yes, I love it. Uh, yeah, I got my first checking account when I was in high school. When I got my first job, I worked at Toys R Us. I got my first check. It was a paper check. So my mom took me down to the local bank that she used. And I had no idea what was going on. I just know I opened two accounts, a savings account and a checking account. They said, I might get some additional stuff in the mail. But nobody really took the time to explain to me what each one was and what they meant and better yet, how to properly use them. So I learned the hard way um, by not having some basic um, banking fundamentals under my belt, um, specifically how to, utilize, how to utilize my checking account properly, um, which is what we're here to cover next. So how does a checking account work? So a checking account is used to manage your day-to-day -day spending. So this is when you need to go to the grocery store, you're going to the movies, you're paying some bills. It's really the main hub for your money that's coming in and going out. So when you put money into your checking account, that's called a deposit. And when money comes out, this is a withdrawal or a little bit more financial lingo for you. It's all about credits and debits. They are super convenient because you will always get normally a debit card to access your account. And we're going to go over debit cards a little later um, or checks. And so it's just easier ways to access your funds in your account instead of using cash. Um, checking accounts are a great way to manage your money without having to, again, carry that cash around with you all day because it's all held in one location in your checking account for you and all your transactions are logged for you keeping track of everything that you're spending. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be keeping track as well. It's really, really important to be conscious and aware of what's coming in and going out of your checking account so that you are making sure that you're responsible for how you're handling your account. Um, these transactions often happen in real time. You know, when you're spending your money, it's spent. And if you overspend, that's when you can overdraw your account, which means you're going negative. You spent too much, you spent money that you don't have, and that can often result in fees, which is never fun. Nobody wants to pay fees back. So a good habit to have is when you're spending your money is to keep track. You can use online banking, always mobile apps on your phones. You can call your credit union or your bank and ask about what's going on in your account. But you really want to know what you have to spend before you're spending so that you're making those um, educated financial decisions and making sure that your account is always in um, a positive good standing. But it's really convenient and you're gonna use, if you don't have one already, you'll, you'll, you'll use your checking account a lot for everything. Um, cash apps like Venmo and Cash App are also connected to your checking accounts. Does anybody here use any of these cash apps? Yes, yeah. Yes is coming through. Yeah, me too. I use Venmo weekly. It's such an easy and very convenient way to transfer money to family and friends who maybe may not bank at the same financial institution as you. And so these are virtual payment apps that allow you to transfer money between you and your friends or your family, or even sometimes businesses take payment through Venmo or a cash shop or Zelle. And they allow you to do the peer-to-peer -peer transfers. So um, just a few things to remember when you do register for these services, if you're under 18, you're most likely need parental authorization because that's just a law that as providing financial services, we have to follow. If you're not an adult, you do need a parent or legal guardian. Um, but once your parents authorize you to have access to this app, it needs to connect to a checking account so that it can access the money that you're sending or gives you a place to make a deposit for any money that you're receiving. So just like making sure you're having funds in your checking account before using a debit card or writing a check, you really want to make sure that you have money in your checking account before trying to send some money money on Venmo, because everything, again, happens in real time. Um, 
And then something to keep in mind is keeping balances in your per, um, virtual payment apps. I can be really guilty of this. A friend will send me some money and I don't transfer it right away. And it just is kind of sitting there. But uh, banks and credit unions, we're insured to keep our members and our customer, customer money safe if anything were to happen. So um, what this means, like at credit unions, um, each signer on an account is insured up to $250,000. So if anything were to happen to us, a national that natural disaster, or you had to close for any reason, your money would be protected. With these cash, cash apps, they're, they're not insured. There's no protection. So if you're carrying a balance and something were to happen to these companies overnight, your money would not be protected and you could potentially lose it with no way of getting it back. So I always recommend make sure that you're transferring money out of these apps into your checking account and into a really safe place so that you're never going to have to worry about losing it. Any overall questions about cash apps? I may not have all the answers, um, but I can definitely try and help address anything as it, as they are connected to your to your bank accounts. One thing that I would like to kind of mention and ask about is um, when a student is getting their first job. Mm -hmm. What do they? What information do they need to bring with them to set up a checking account, so that they can then you know. Once they've set up a checking account, how do they go about linking it to a cash app? Um, because we do have opportunities this summer where people may need to be able to um, have direct deposits of a paycheck, or they may need to be able to sell products and have a way to get that money through a cash app to, you know, their actual use. Yes, great question. So we are going to talk about how to open an account in a little bit. Oh, great. Um, and <laughs> Sorry. Actually, no, no, it's, this is a great question. And actually, it's a good segue because I was going to talk about what direct deposit is next. So kind of a perfect timing. Yeah, so uh, direct deposit. Yeah, so I'll talk about how to open an account and everything that you need to bring in to a financial institution here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, like direct deposit, if you're you have a job, um, and you need to be able to put money into your account and, and, and your employer wants to do it electronically, which is also called through um, direct deposit. It's another piece of your checking account. Um, and so does anybody here currently have a job where they get direct deposit into a checking account? In the chat. Yes, we got one yes. Yeah. So direct deposit is when money, specifically if it's an employer, um, is putting your paycheck electronically into your account. It's getting sent out rather than them giving you a physical check either in the mail or they're handing it to you on payday. So it's just a really quick and convenient way to get your paycheck into your account without any additional hassle of having to figure out how you're going to deposit this check. Your HR departments at your work will usually be the ones to set this up. Um, often asking for a blank check or for you to fill out a form um, with what's called your routing number and your account number. Um, can anybody guess or share what they think a routing number might be? No, that's okay. So a routing number, it's a nine digit number that's assigned specifically and different for every single financial institution so that anyone who has the ability to send money can and can ensure that it goes to the very right place. So here at For It, we have our very own unique routing number. Um, it's on the bottom of your checks if you have checks. Um, and then it's also available to utilize other ways. Um, some of these cash apps will ask for a routing number sometimes as well so that they know exactly where to send the account and the money if you're not connecting it to a checking account. And so it's just a really key feature of, of us as a financial institution. And then another feature of direct deposit is that you can specify the amount that you want to go and where. So if you have two checking accounts or even two savings accounts, checking and a savings, um, you can set them up and it can be split up and sent to different places to make it really easy and convenient. And it does all of the work for you. So 
the money is deposited right into your account on payday and it's ready to use. So that's another um, component to a checking account. And then this will bring us to debit cards. So does anybody here have a debit card? Yes. Yes. Yeah, me too. And how do you, if you're comfortable sharing, how do you use your, your debit card the most? Grocery store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so buy fast food, go to the ATM, Starbucks. Yes, I always use my card at Starbucks. Yeah, these are all really great answers. So um, debit cards are a super, buying video games, exactly. Yeah, debit cards are super little convenient, little plastic cards uh, that are attached to your checking account. They're all assigned a different number that's unique to you um, and are accepted virtually anywhere. Um, in stores, online, at the ATM. Um, it's the, again, the, another alternative to carrying around cash with you. So it makes it a little bit more secure. Um, and it's just a quick swipe or a tap. You can even put it on your phone. Some of you may have Apple Pay where you're just tapping with your phone now, which is really neat. Um, and it, you know, it accesses the money in your account really quickly for you. And so just like we talked about at the beginning, when you use your debit card, the funds are automatically removed from your account or debited from your account, which is why it's called a debit card. Um, so it's really, really important when you're utilizing your debit card to keep track of your spending by checking your account online, using your mobile app to make sure that you have that money available to spend it before trying to swipe your card. So it's not an endless supply of money, even though you can't see the money on it. It's, you know, if you're utilizing it on your checking account, you know, the money, it, once you use it, it's gone. So you always want to be really careful about that. And then each debit card also comes with a PIN. Can anybody guess what PIN stands for? Exactly, personal identification number. So if you have a debit card and you know you've used it, you know that you're asked to enter in, most of the time it's four digits, five digits, at this at the store or at the ATM. Um, can anybody share why they think we have pins for our debit cards? Safety, security, exactly. It's for security. This is to make sure that nobody who shouldn't be um, has access to your money. So this means if you lose your card or it gets stolen, which does happen, nobody can just go to the ATM and pull it out and just take all of your money. So this means that you should never share your pin with anybody. Um, don't write it down on your card um, or keep it written in your wallet or in your purse anywhere. You really want to memorize it so that you're keeping your money safe. Yeah, these are great. Any questions about debit cards before I, we, we move on? Great. So um, how to open an account? So this was the question that Heather asked. And so now that we've talked about checking accounts, um, how do you open an account and what do you need to bring in? So you need to have three key pieces of identification to open an account. Um, you have to have photo ID, social security number, or an, um, a tax identification number. Um, and you have to be able to provide a physical address. Um, if you're under 18, you're going to need to have an adult or a legal guardian to be able to sign for you because, again, it's a law that we have to follow that if you're not considered an adult, you can't act on an account by yourself. Um, but here at For It, anybody, so if you have a legal guardian, what if you don't want your parent or guardian to know you're opening an account? Um, there's really no way around it, unfortunately. So you uh, you have to provide your birthday as well. So, which goes along with having your photo ID. So if you're under the age of 18, we cannot open an account for you. So um, it's really hard <laughs> to hide that from a parent. Um, so, but you wanna, if you wanna open an account, you know, you wanna be having those open conversations with your parent or your guardian or any adult um that you're that you're living with that's helping taking care of you so 
you really can't get around not telling, not telling anybody that you want an open account unless you're over the age of 18. So that's a really good question. Um, uh, yes. And then you can open it online or in person. So um, most financial institutions allow you to do it online if coming in isn't convenient for you. Um, or if you did want to go in and have that face-to-face -face conversation with somebody, you can always just walk right into a bank or credit union and they'll be happy to help you open an account. And then something I did want to touch on because we are going to talk about credit in a little bit. Um, if you want to open an account with a credit union, um, and you don't have a social security number and you really want to be ready to get a car loan down the line or a credit card down the line, um, or you know you want some of your um, family members to be able to access some of these, there are three credit unions in the local area that I just wanted to recommend really quick that can help you if you don't have a social security number, but you have a tax identification number. Um, the first one's WANA Credit Union. Their main footprint is out on the coast, like St. Helens, Scappoose. Um, they have a Vernonia branch, but they also have a Forest Grove branch um, for the Washington County. And if you live in the Western Washington County or Clatsop County, Columbia County, um, you're all eligible to join you and your family. And so um, I highly recommend going to them for some of your credit needs um, if you're over the age of 18 or you're approaching 18. And then the next is Unitas. They're much more widespread and some of you may have um, heard of them before, but they're available to anybody in most counties. So Washington County, Multnomah County, Columbia County, Clackamas County, um, and, and many, many more. And so they also can do um, non-citizen banking. They can do um, lots of stuff with just ITINs. And then the third is Point West Credit Union. Um, they are the smallest of the two, but this type of banking is really, it's what they do. They only have one location, though, near Lloyd Center in Portland, but they're set up to help anyone who needs them. Um, and we'll be providing a digital handout in the next day or so with all this information on it for you as well. So I just wanted to touch on that since we're going to be talking about credit here in a little bit. And for it currently doesn't do anything um, lending wise um, if you don't have a Social Security number, not yet. And so I wanted to make sure that we provided this resource for you. Um, any questions about anything that we've gone over? Um, so I had a quick question. Um, so if you're under the age of 18, and um, would you be able to get like an adult checking account? So it's yours solely or would it be kind of off your parents or do you know what I mean? Yes, that's okay. a great question. So yeah, when you do open an account, it is in your name and it's all of your information, um, but your parents would just have to be a signer on it. So when you turned 18, you could take them off. Um, we have that conversation with a lot of um, uh, minors that are transitioning into adult adulthood um, to making sure that they're able to be independent and kind of have their finances a little bit more private. So yes, that's a great question. The account is in your name. It's all of your information. But until you turn 18, you have to have somebody that's over the age of 18 on the account with you. Um, but once you transition into adulthood, then we'll be having uh, that conversation and you can kind of make it your own. So did I answer then, your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then we have another person in the chat and says, why is Point West so small? Did they choose not to expand? That's a good question. They're trying. Um, expanding um, credit unions can be difficult. Um, finding retail space to make sure that the branch is accessible to everybody. Um, but not working there, I don't have um, all of the answers, but credit unions all grow um, and expand at different rates. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have the answer. Um, but that is a really good question. But they do phenomenal things out in the community. And even though they're not as big as Unitas or as Wana, they can do everything just the same and they really paved the way for um non-citizen banking or ITIN lending like um so just because they're small don't don't doubt that they can't help you um but I know their location can make it a little bit different but um they're always willing to go the extra mile to help their members or anybody who has questions so um don't don't let their size discourage you from reaching out 
That's a good question though. Oh, question. What made you want to get into the banking profession? Really good question. Um, I didn't want to work weekends anymore. I was uh, in my early 20s working at the mall. And so I had to work Saturdays and Sundays and I just, I didn't want to do it anymore. And my mom used to be a teller at US Bank and before I was born and she told me how much she loved it. And I've always loved working with people. And I just thought it would be something really temporary to get me to wherever I, you know, I was in this moment of self-discovery. <laughs> I was young and uh, I didn't think I'd be here this long and now I am. And I, and I absolutely loved it. And uh, this is my career now. This is where I see myself going and retiring in credit unions. And yeah, so I just, it, I just fell into them. It's not what I had planned, but um, you know, the universe had bigger plans for me, I guess. And this is where I was meant to be. So that's a good question, which is funny because a lot of people in the banking profession often say the same thing. It was never their plan. They just kind of happened upon it and it was just, it was for them. Okay, question. Any other questions about anything that we've covered so far? No? Okay. So let's jump right in to savings accounts. So um, if you're comfortable sharing, um, how do you all currently save? Like, do you have a savings account? Do you use a piggy bank? You can go ahead and just pop that in the chat. Savings account, savings account. Perfect. Yeah, I love to see that um, some of you are already starting to establish savings habits, which is really, um, really important. So um, in this portion, I'm just going to go over the types of savings accounts that are out there um, and then go over some good saving habits to start developing to help set you up for success later. Um, now, there's a few different types of savings accounts out there, um, and I'm just going to go over some of the really most common ones that you're going to find at your local financial institutions. Um, and some of them you may have already heard of before. And so I'll just kind of explain a little bit more about what they do. Um, the first is just a general savings account. So this is the account that's standard. Everybody gets one when they open an account at the credit union. Um, it's just a little spot to store some money that doesn't really have a purpose, but you don't want it in your checking account. It's just kind of back up for anything that you need. Um, and then there are some more elaborate savings accounts that are really tailored to your specific needs and your financial goals. Um, like for example, here at For It, we have a few. One of them is called our rainy day fund. Um, and this account, it pays a little bit more interest um, than our basic savings account. And it's designed to help you save for a rainy day. Can anybody guess what I mean when I say rainy day? Accidents, unexpected emergency, emergency. Exactly it. Unexpected expenses like emergencies, medical bills, car repairs, anything that can cost money when life, it happens, right? Um, a bad day. Yeah, these accounts can really help you be strict with your savings because you're limited on how often you can access them. Um, and it really helps put into focus about what you're saving for. Um, and so you're limited on how often you can access them without sometimes there's penalties involved which really makes you sit back and think, do I really need to pull this money out? Is it for its intended purpose? Or do I just like wanna buy something and I see my money sitting there? Or, you know, if I take this out, is it gonna impact my future financial goals? So we always wanna make sure that when we're saving, we're really, really strategic about how, we're, how, we're, how and when we're taking that money out and if it's really for its intended purpose. So we also have accounts for holiday time, taxes, everything. So um, when people talk about savings accounts, it could it, it can be a whole spectrum of financial needs that they have for all of their goals. And then next we have certificates of deposits. Has anybody ever heard of these before? They're also referred to as CDs and not the kind that you play music on. I don't even know if people use CDs anymore. Nope. Yeah, I never heard of them either before I started working in credit unions. So um, 
a CD or a certificate of deposit is what is referred to as a time deposit. So when you open a CD, you select a very specific period of time that the funds are unavailable, um, but they're earning interest. So they're earning new money on your money. And then this interest is earned usually, again, a little higher because that's the incentive to get you to save and put this money aside. Um, and then after that time that you've selected is up, you can either take the money out because it's ready for the intended purpose, um, or you want to put in a different type of an account, um, or you can let it go back into another CD and just keep, again, earning money um, on your money until you need it. So here at For It, you can open up CDs for six months, one year, two year, or three years, um, and then that money it's set aside and it's just, it's not available for you until that time is up. And so a lot of Folks use these if they know they want to go on vacation in two years and they've got that money saved up and they don't want to have it accessible, they'll put it in a CD so that they know in two years it's going to be ready to go. It's earned a little bit more money and they haven't spent it because it hasn't been available. Yes, great question. If you do need to take it out because of like an emergency or you just really need the money for something else, you are penalized for taking it out, but they are typically small penalties. So here um, at For It, if you have to withdraw from your CD early, um, we'll deduct 180 days worth of interest that you've earned. So depending on the interest rates at the time, it could be a few dollars to $20. So, and that's a conversation that we'll have with you. If you say you um, you come in and you wanna withdraw your CD early, we'll let you know what the penalty will be. So then you can make that educated decision if, if you wanna move forward. Um, but that's a really great question. Yes, other banks and credit unions all also have CDs. And the time that they are may be different. So we all may offer them, but they may just be for different time periods. And so it's important for you to do some research to see which one would work best for you um, and ask those questions at the financial institutions. Great questions. Awesome. And then next, I'm just gonna talk really quickly about money market accounts. Um, these are generally used and met for much larger balances, like 150, $250,000, a lot of money um, that you wanna use relatively frequently and have easy access to, but not using it for your day to day. Um, and again, they also earn some higher interest. You don't want this in a restrictive account because you know you're going to use it at least twice a month for whenever your personal spending habits are. Um, and so you can have checks often with these. You can make transfers out of these. And so they're just kind of meant for those big, bigger balances, but you don't want to put them away. Um, and they're a little bit more detailed, so I don't want to go too in-depth about money markets, but most, if not all, financial institutions also offer them. And again, they're tailored to your specific, your specific needs. And then we have retirement accounts. Um, at most credit unions or banks, they're, they're called IRAs, which stands for Individual Retirement Account. And these allow you to put money away specifically for when you're ready to retire. And there's certain limitations and guidelines and rules that we have to follow regarding these accounts. And so when you're ready to open one or you have questions about one, um, your personal banker or if you have a financial advisor when you get a little bit older, um, they'll be able to give you all the information about the different ones and which one's going to work best for you and, again, what your goals are. So lots of different ways to save. Do we have any questions about any of the savings accounts that we've gone over or about saving in general? Not that I can see. Okay. Oh, how old should you be to start a retirement account? Great question. That's a really personal decision. Um, you can start one as soon as you turn, you can start an IRA as soon as you turn 18 but you have to have a job. So the money that goes into an IRA has to be from money that you've earned in income working at a job. So um, what does a typical day look like for you? Um, and so, yeah, so 
that's just the key thing with IRAs is that it has to be money that's earned from wages that you've earned from an employer. Um, and, but typically you start one um, as soon as you start working. That's my general rule so that the sooner you, the sooner you start taking um, money and setting it aside for retirement, the better you're going to be. And when you're working, um, your employer will also will talk to you about um, retirement savings options as well. What does a typical day look like for me? I'll answer that one at the end. Is that okay? Because it's, it's, it varies every day, but that's a really fun question. Okay. So now that we've talked all about a little bit about different savings accounts, we're going to get into some budgeting and what that means, because that goes in hand in hand with saving, right? Um, so does anybody here have any financial goals that they want to share, like anything that you're saving up to buy? Buy a car. Great. Yes. Vacation. Yeah. Xbox. Exactly. Yeah, these are all really great goals because car, college tuition, apartment deposit. Yes, those are not <clears throat> inexpensive. Yeah. These are really great goals. And so in order, my current financial goals, I'm saving for a vacation. I really want to go to Ireland in a couple of years and that's very expensive. And so I have to budget to make sure that I can save enough money so that I can achieve my goal. So it's important to make a plan for saving, but also your spending. And so this is called making a budget. And an important piece of creating an accurate budget is by tracking how much money is coming in and how much money goes out each month. So we're gonna talk about that. <clears throat> so understanding that aspect of a budget is all about understanding what's called your cash flow. So the concept of money coming in, you know, your income or if you're getting birthday money, um, Christmas money, um, and the money going out, so those are your expenses and your the money that you're spending, it's all called your cash flow. So just like an ocean has waves that go in and out with the tide, so does our money. It's always coming and going. So the difference is that we can control our budget a little bit better um, by uh, controlling our cash flow by creating a really good budget. So if you have a piece of paper or you um, just want to kind of keep track in your mind, think about what you may have spent some money on in the last couple of days. You know, have you bought some food? Did you go to Target and buy some clothes? Um, bought a video game? Anything that you've purchased, just think about it for a moment. Okay. And if you're comfortable again sharing, go ahead and type into the chat or come off mute and you can share some of the things that you've purchased in the last few days. Going out to dinner. I bought a coffee this morning. Groceries, workout clothes, some snacks, sweatpants. Always love a good pair of sweatpants. Gas, yeah. Great. Yes, thank you for sharing. So there are so many different types of expenses that everybody has. And there are what we call fixed expenses. And so those are the same exact each month. So who can name what they think would be a fixed expense? Bills, exactly. Rent. Yes, rent, phone payment, your car payment, your car insurance. Those are all fixed expenses because you know how much they're going to be every single month. And then on the flip side of that, we have what are called variable expenses. So can you think of what some of those would be? Gas, yes, always varying. <laughs> you never know how much you're using or how much you're going to need. Groceries, exactly. Yes, these are all great. So yeah, things like food and gas and clothes, entertainment, you know, going to the movies, you're not going into the movies, you know, the same amount of time every single month. So these are all variable expenses. 
So it's important to understand how much you know you need to budget for each month by your fixed expenses, and then also try to limit and put a budget on your flexible expenses, like going out, buying clothes. You really want to make sure that you're putting those in a budget so that you can also put that money in any extra money that you have into savings and to be able to cover those both fixed and variable expenses. So that's just a little bit about how cash flow works. Now, just like we need to track the money that's going out by using our debit card or writing checks or getting money from the ATM, we also need to keep track of the money that's coming into our account. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any money to spend. So this all ties back to our cash flow that we have to monitor to determine our budget to meet our financial goals. So when you have a job and you get paid, you have what is called a gross income. Can anybody guess, share what they think a gross income is? Exactly. It's the income that is the total amount of money that you earn before taxes. Perfect. And then we have um, net pay. So what do we think net pay means? Money after taxes. Exactly. So it's what we have left over once all of our taxes are deducted from each of our paycheck. This is the actual amount of money that you're taking home and the number that you want to start with with building a budget because it's 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 the amount of money that you're getting. So if you have a net pay of $1,500 a month, you want to ensure that all of your expenses, both fixed and variable, so your rate, uh, so your rent, if you have a car payment, um, if you have some other bills, your utilities. And then also your variable, how much gas are you going to need that month? Are you going to be going out to dinner with friends? You always want to make sure that everything is covered by that number that you know is coming in every month and implementing it into your budget. And then just really quickly, there is this kind of a guideline um, out there that says 50-30-20 rule when budgeting for your money. So 50% um, of your paycheck should be set aside for essentials, like your rent, your car payment, your groceries. 30% should be for your non-essentials. So, you know, going out, having fun, buying clothes, and then also putting about 20% um, aside for your future savings goals. This may not always work for everybody. Sometimes your essentials are much more than 50% of your budget. But this is just a kind of rough guideline to kind of help get you started on where to start when planning out a budget. <clears throat> and there's various ways to track your budget as well. So some people like to use a spreadsheet and Excel and just track everything. Um, you can actually get a paper worksheet if you like to write it out. But also a lot of financial institutions will have a free product or service. That's a money management um, application that you can use to set goals track your budget and it's all right there available for you on your phone or on your computer and just make it really easy to, for you to keep up on what you're spending and where you're spending and if you're saving and, and you're meeting your goals. So any questions about budgeting? I know this is very general and so I don't want to overload you, but I don't wanna give you enough information just to kind of give you a good idea of where to start. What does it mean to balance a checkbook? That's a really good question. So when you open up a checking account, um, you want to track all of your expenses and everything that is coming in. So then um, when you compare it to what's online or the records that we have, you want to make sure that it's all in balance and so that everything is accounted for. And then, so if there's any offages, which means um, differences in what you think you should have or what we say that you should have, you're able to kind of track it back. And it's just to make sure that you're always keeping um, kind of count of where your money is coming and going. Did I answer your question? I know it can be a little tricky to answer that. But yeah, balancing a checkbook is just making sure everything is where it's supposed to be and that you've, if you've kept track of every expense and every um, deposit that's been coming in and out of your account. It all goes back to just checking, 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 checking your account online. Great questions. All right. 
So now it's time to touch um, on credit. Does anybody here um, already have a credit card or a car loan? Um, any of the students, you know, have their parents got them a car that their name's on that's helping them go to credit? Yes, lots. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Yes, I do too. Yeah, I have a car loan, um, some credit cards. Yeah, so we're going to go over a few pieces of credit, um, specifically what is credit, what is a credit score, and the difference between good debt and bad debt. Um, and so we're just going to touch on those really quickly, um, just to kind of give you a good idea of what, what each of those mean. So um, <clears throat> what is credit, right? So credit means uh, the ability to borrow money. So there are several situations where people need to borrow money from what are called lenders. So maybe they need to buy a car, um, they need to buy a house, they need to go to school. So they're gonna take out some student loans. So in each case, you are borrowing money from a lender or financial institution with a promise to pay it back. And that money that you borrow, you then owe, is called a debt. And earning the trust and the confidence of a financial institution to lend you this money is the process of establishing credit. So by showing lenders that you're trustworthy, you're strengthening your ability to borrow again the next time, and then the next time, um, and then this is called having a good credit record or having a good credit score. So each time you're borrowing money, you enter into a contract to pay it back over a set amount of time with monthly payments, with interest, so this is an additional fee added to the loan. Um, so it's the cost of borrowing money, but it's also what helps businesses be able to afford to lend out the money as well. And then can anybody share benefits that they can think of for using credit? Yeah, building your credit score. Exactly, buying something you can't afford at one time, like a car, exactly. So yeah, it's the option of buying something today and paying the money back over time rather than having to wait. And it also gives you the flexibility to act on major purchases like buying a car um, and life opportunities that may require more money than you have on hand right now, like buying a house. Houses are so expensive. Most people can't pay for those in cash. So credit unions and banks are able to loan money for you to be able to buy a house, um, go to college. Yeah, have the access to money you need if you need it for um, like medical bills or just anything that's going on in your life. Credit allows you to be able to access that money um, instead of having to wait if you don't have it like saved in your savings account. Really good. And then what about risks about using credit? Can anybody share what they think what risks might be involved? Owing too much, borrowing more than you can't pay back. Yeah, paying more than you spend. Too much debt. Yes, exactly it. So, right, there's always, you know, benefits and risks to everything, um, including credit. So, yeah, overdoing it, borrowing more money than you can afford. You guys hit the nail on the head. You can't make your payments on time because things have changed since when you first got a loan, you know, and that'll damage your credit report, which makes it hard for you to get credit in the future. And then some people just don't like having to pay interest on borrowing money. So that's just a risk that they're not willing to take. So it's always to be, it's always really important to be educated on when you're borrowing money and making sure that you know all of the options available to you. So you're making those really educated decisions again that are going to help you achieve your financial goals and not put you in a rough spot. So good loan officers will always make sure to have those conversations with you. They'll go over your income, your fixed expenses, to ensure that the money that you're asking for is something that you can afford, and it's not going to put you in a really bad financial spot where you'll ultimately not be able to pay it back. What can you do if you're not good at saving money? Really good question. Um, 
my tip for that is start small. You know, if don't, don't set a too high of a savings goal where you're like, I'm going to save a hundred dollars a month, but can you afford it? So start with, I'm going to save $20 every time I get my paycheck. And then once you're really comfortable with that, you've worked it into your budget up it a little bit more. Now I'm going to start saving $25 a paycheck. You're going to work that into your budget. So saving, it's all about, yes, exactly. You're paying yourself. You're rewarding yourself by putting money away. And so um, it takes discipline. It takes practice. Not everybody can do it right away. Um, You know, you see your money in your savings account and you're like, oh, I really want this. And so I'm going to buy it. So it's also thinking about your wants versus your needs. Do I need this new car versus do I want this new car, right? Do I need this video game or do I want this video game? So yeah, it's, you're rewarding yourself by savings. And I always just say, start small, start with what you are comfortable with and what you can afford and just slowly increase it over time. So you get that really good discipline and you've created a habit, right? What do they say? You have to do something 21 days in a row to make it a habit. So just try it a little bit at a time and then, and you'll get there. It's hard and it's not easy for everybody. And it's okay if you stumble and you're not saving as much as you want, but just keep going at it and, you know, just keep working at it. It's a lifelong thing. Really good question and really good. Yeah. Pay yourself. Great. Perfect. So this is going to bring us into um, credit scores. So your credit record over time will generate what is called a credit score. And this is just a numerical number that's generated by many factors, um, based on your credit record. So that includes your payment history. Are you paying your bills on time? You know, what are your balances? Do you have all your credit cards maxed out? Do you have too many loans? You know, how long have you had these accounts? So there's all these different little factors that pay play into how a credit score is built. And I work in the financial industry and it can still be muddy at times on how it all actually happens. And, um, but knowledge is power. We're going to get into that in just a minute, but yeah, so that's what your credit score is. It's a number, um, that's generated based on all of your past credit records. So uh, if you want to put it into the chat, what do you think a good credit score is? 800. 800, yeah. Mm -hmm. 715, 800. 730. Yeah, these are all really great answers. So credit scores range from 300 points to 850 points. And I'm just going to put this out there. Again, I've been in the industry a long time. I've only seen a handful of people with over an 800 credit score. So don't beat yourself up if you don't have one. Um, and But it, they do say, obviously, the higher, the better. So the main thing that you want to remember um, that is going to affect your credit score is your payment history. And we'll kind of get that into a minute. But yeah, anything over 730 points is considered A plus, um, roughly between 650 to 730 is B. And then obviously the lower you go, they give you a paper grade, right? So typically anything below like 600, 630 is considered not great credit. And that's when you can start having problems getting loans um, that you're applying for. Um, so Obviously, the higher your score, the more lenders are likely to offer to you because the score indicates that you've handled your past credit really well. Um, and I just want to point out that payment history is key. So if you miss a payment or go what's called delinquent, you're not making your payments, these types of negative records will ex- negatively impact your score the most out of anything when it comes to your credit. So it's always so, so important to be making your payments on time and implementing them into your budget to make sure that you're getting them in on time and that you're paying at least the minimum amount that's due. And if you ever find yourself in a financial situation where you can no longer afford your payments that you once could, because again, life happens, um, always, always reach out to your lender and 
they'll always want to work with you. So just call them up, let them know that you're struggling and, and they'll want to work with you to find a way to make it happen. So just always be um, communicating instead of just don't pretend like it's not happening because that's just going to hurt you more in the long run. And then also, depending on what are called credit bureaus, so those are the ones who generate your scores based on your credit records. There's three of them out there. Um, so your score may look a little different depending on who you're working with. And again, this is a, a frustrating piece of the credit area in finances because we don't control the credit bureaus. Um, but you can check your credit every year by free for vis by visiting annualcreditreport.com. And it's so, so important that you take advantage of this because it's going to give you a good idea of what's on your credit report. Um, you want to make sure that nothing re is reporting incorrectly. Um, you can catch fraud this way. So if you have identity theft, um, there's also apps, free apps like Credit Karma or um, your local financial institution may have a program like we do and where you can access your credit risk score for free as well, just right in your mobile app. So I always say knowledge is power. The more information that you can know about what's going on with your credit, the better. So um, always being on top of what's happening is really important. Any questions about credit scores before we, I've got one last piece and then we'll open it up for general Q&A. Nope. Oh, how do you start building a credit score? Great question. This is always tricky, um, but you wanna start um, small. So it could be a small credit card, um, and you can get what's called a secured credit card where they ask uh, your financial institution will ask you to deposit $300 to secure a $300 limit on your card. Um, or, um, you know, getting a car loan if you can. Sometimes you may need somebody to co-sign for you. So that means somebody that already has established credit can help get you a loan. Um, and then in a couple of years, you can, you can have it in your own name. Um, and so just starting small. So my best advice is again, to talk to your parents or talk to your um, adult that you're living with or anybody in your family or reach out to your local um, credit union and, you know, they'll be able to help you get you some building blocks on, okay, this is where you need to start, but um, you have to have money to pay back debt. So having a job is really important because um, nobody's going to be able to lend you money if you can't prove that you can pay it back. So once you get a job um, and you're over the age of 18, you know, call up your credit union, call us and we'll be able to help you out. What age did you start having credit to start the credit history? That's a great question. So it's different for everybody. Um, but I would say, you know, again, as soon as you have some stable income and you are in a really good spot to kind of start small uh, and, you know, if you want to do it on your own and you're over the age of 18, I think um, that's a great place to start. Um, but yeah, once you know that you can afford to pay back any debts that you owe, um, that's that's the best age. So it's it's really it's different for everybody. But the sooner that you start, um, the better because this is always tricky. But no credit is worse than bad credit, if that makes sense, um, because you don't have any history for anybody to go off of, and so um, it can be a little bit tricky. But I would always suggest going to your local credit union, um, and they're they're going to want to have those conversations with you to help get you started. I hope I answered your question. So, okay. So um, to wrap up our chat about credit today, I just wanted to quickly, quickly touch on good debt versus bad debt because not all debt is bad, right? So speaking generally, um, debt that you're able to repay responsibly um, on the loan that you've agreed to pay back is good debt. You know, having favorable payment history, showing that you can be responsibly be handling a mix of different types of debt may be reflected in your credit score. Um, and also good debt can be a loan used to finance something that will offer a good return on the investment. So like your car, 
um, student loans, you're going to school, um, a house, you know, those are all considered good debt. And then bad debt is that uh, when you're unable to repay. So I know it says credit cards on my screen, but not all credit cards are bad debt. But, um, you know, if you have credit cards with high balances um, and you're carrying that over every single month, that can um, be translated into bad debt. So if you can pay, if you can afford to pay your credit cards off every month, that's a really important key. Um, and then again, another rule of thumb is to never carry more than 30% of your available balance on a credit card. So if you have a thousand dollar limit, try not to over have over $300 um, on there at any given time, because this shows that you can also handle the debt responsibly and that you can afford it um, and that you're not over spending your monthly income and, you know, having to live off of your credit cards because that's just going to get you in a really bad spot. And then high interest loans can also be really harmful to your credit score. So loans from payday lenders can be really difficult to pay back because of the high rate. And that just puts people in a really bad cycle of not being able to um, um, pay it back. Then you have those missed payments and then now you've got some bad debt on your record. So I know this was just a really high level overview, but it's just to kind of explain that not all debt is bad debt. It's really about what you're borrowing money for and how you're handling it once you've got it um, in your name. So just, yeah, it all comes down to not borrowing more than you can afford and handling it responsibly. Um, can you open a credit card and just not use it? Will that still have your credit score? Generally it won't. And I know that's a really weird <laughs> thing. Um, but if you just have a credit card and it has no balance on there, then you're not showing that you can properly utilize it. So having a credit card with no balance doesn't help you, but it also doesn't hinder you. Um, but if you, you know, I know a lot of people who will exclusively buy their groceries and or pay all, all of their bills with their credit card and then pay it off every month because they have already budgeted it for it with their income. And then that shows you've put a limit on it, but you're using it responsibly because you're paying it off every month. So yeah, it's not going to benefit or not benefit you. So utilizing it responsibly and just showing that I can have this credit card, I can use it, but I can also pay it off. So that's a great question. All right. I know I just threw a lot at you. Um, some of it may have been really out of the box, don't understand it. Um, but what, and if any questions do you have about anything that we've covered or anything just in general? I know somebody asked me what my normal day looks like for me, so I can answer that question. Um, it all, every day is different. <laughs> um, right now, like right now we're doing a lot of training because we've hired a lot of new people. Um, so I'll, I usually get around eight or eight 30, check my email, um, have some meetings. And then right now I'm training a lot of people on products. So how to talk to our members about our products and services. Um, I'm on some that I, I get trained myself. So I attend a lot of, uh, trainings and webinars to keep up on what's happening in credit unions in the Pacific Northwest and, um, nationally, um, and we're opening a new branch. So there's a lot of conversations about the build out of the branch and what's going into that and just different ways that we can connect with our members. So I may be out at a community event one day and not in the office at all. Um, and so every day is really different, but it's a lot of fun. So, um, but if I were a teller on the teller line, I'd be downstairs, um, you know, helping members day in and day out and answering the phone. So my job's a lot of fun because I get to do all these different things. How many credit cards would you recommend having? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't have a set number because there are different credit cards that people use for different uses. So sometimes you can get a really good credit card that's good for traveling. Um, there's really good credit cards for cash back, but it all, I mean, I wouldn't say like 10 or 15, that's probably too many. You just want to make sure that the amount of credit cards that you have that you can pay those uh, minimum monthly balances and that they fit into your budget. So average amount, people probably have two or three credit cards. Um, so again, it all 
it's always a personal number. Can you have four or five or is one just going to fit in your budget? Um, at what age can you start working at a bank? Um, great question. Um, some that you can start as working as young as 16, um, as soon as you're able to start working legally in the state of Oregon. Um, some credit unions or banks have high school programs where if they're in your high school, then you can work for them. But 16 is generally where you can work with some. It's tricky because we're open Monday through Friday, typically nine to five during school hours. So if there's not a, um, like a high school program, um, once you're out of high school is always a great age to get in because you're not in school every day. Um, but yeah, as soon as you can start working legally, uh, some banks allow you to work um, right away. I have friends that work in credit unions that started in high school and um, are still in credit unions. So it's really cool. Do you have any online resources that would recommend? Yes, we actually partner with a company called Zogo. Um, and that'll be included um, on this little infographic that will be provided for you guys as well um, that you can use and it's in, um, that'll help you with all personal financial. So, and it's gamified. So you get to play some games, learn a little bit. Um, but Credit Karma also has really good financial information, Nerd Wallet typically. But um, us at Fort Credit Union, we partner with some financial education partners um, like Zogo and Green Path. So um, Green Path is a great one and we can provide you with that information as well. That's a great question. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for letting me come and talk to you about Banking 101. Um, if you ever have questions, this is my contact information. Um, that's my direct phone number and that's my email. Um, feel free to call or email me anytime and I'm happy to help you um, to the best of my ability when it comes to your, your financial goals. So, and we hope to see all of you when we open our branch up in Hillsboro. And that's all I have. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sarah, for, um, you know, teaching us about <laughs> Um, all the financial basics. I know I learned quite a bit. I always, I've had a credit card and I still don't really know exactly what's happening with that. So, um, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>